wonderful to be in the house of the Lord worshiping with God's people. Well, good morning, Plymouth Church of the Nazarene, in-house and online. I'm Pastor Dusty, and you are loved. In the world of professional sports, uh, John Jones is not a household name, but he's one of the greatest martial artists who have ever lived. Uh, he became the youngest UFC champion at age 23, and his career looked promising. He's incredibly athletic, smart, well-rounded, but there was one opponent that John could never defeat himself. When he was at work fighting, he was amazing. He was always getting better and finding ways to dig deep and defeat his opponents. But when he was fighting his addictions and his issues at home, he was losing the battle time and time again. He got in a car crash with a pregnant woman and fled the scene. Uh, he had domestic violence issues, numerous street drug and steroid charges, and on and on and on. John just could not get clean uh, and free from his addictions. So he surrounded himself with people that pulled him into a life that was dangerous for everyone involved. He would often party at the club the night before a championship fight so that if he lost, he could then blame his performance on the drugs and the alcohol and not have to take full responsibility for his own performance. As a professional fighter, you only have about 15 prime years, and John has been out for at least half of those between suspensions, court cases, investigations. John is a cautionary tale of wasted potential. He has incredible natural athletic ability. He works hard. He has a great gym and a great team uh, that has brought him to the highest level of martial arts. But he has chosen to surround himself with a community of arrogance, addiction, fame, and excuses that has stolen so much of what his legacy could be. Now, it is unlikely that any of us in this room are wasting our potential as world-class heavyweight martial artists. But there is something that God has gifted you with to make an impact on your generation, and we have to ask ourselves, what are we doing with it? We'll open up to Matthew chapter 25. Jesus says this, Again, the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of a man going on a long trip. He called together his servants and entrusted his money to them while he was gone. He gave five bags of silver to one, two bags of silver to another, and one bag of silver to the last, dividing it in proportion to their abilities. He then left on his trip. Now, for those of you that are curious, I wonder how much money that is. Well, silver moves up and down like the stock market, and uh, yesterday it was at $739 per kilogram. So, and a talent is 34 kilos. So one bag of silver, a talent of silver, is about just over $25,000. So one guy was given $25,000 to invest, another was given $50,000 to invest, and another was given a quarter million. Now the boss was not a micromanager. He just handed out bags of money and took off. Would you like a boss like that? If you're a producer, you do. Give me the resources and get out of my way. But not everybody responds to opportunities the same way. Why might that be? Look at verse 16. The servant who received the five bags of silver began to invest the money and earn five more. The servant with two bags of silver went to work and he earned two more. But the servant who received one bag of silver dug a hole in the ground and hid the master's money. Now, keep in mind, this is not their personal money. Um, and if that was you, does that make you more or less cautious when you're investing it? Um, do you drive safer or crazier in the company car or a vacation rental car? Do you treat the office kitchen better or worse than your kitchen at home? If you're entrusted with the master's money, what emotions come from feeling the weight of that in your hands? Well, what if we did that at church today? What if on your way out, we handed each person a $100 bill and said, this is your responsibility to turn this into more money, and at the end of the year, every cent that you've raised is going to adopt orphans in Uganda. Would you grab that $100 bill, ignore the purpose, and treat your family to a nice lunch at Olive Garden? Or would you refuse the money for fear that you might lose it? 
Or would you be thrilled with the trust given to you and the opportunity and challenge to use your abilities and your business skills to grow a ministry and serve orphans in another country? People have very different and very strong reactions to money. Well, money is a tool. It's not inherently bad or good. The love of money leads to the root of all kinds of evil. But that happens if you're rich, poor, or anywhere in between. However, managing money is both a learnable skill and a spiritual gift. Have you ever thought of money as part of your ministry toolkit? So, you may or may not have a teaching, hospitality, construction, prayer, healing, or administrative spiritual gift, but we all have to deal with money. And some people have a supernatural ability to manage it well and maximize kingdom purposes. So if that's you, don't be ashamed of your gift. Use it to make disciples and invest in ministry that will far outlast your lifetime. Let's go back to verse 19. After a long time, the master returned from his trip, and he called them to give an account of how they had used his money. The servant that he entrusted the five bags of silver came forward with five more and said, Master, you gave me five bags of silver to invest. See, I have earned five more. The master was full of praise. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling this small amount. Now, first of all, if my boss gave me a quarter million dollars to invest and he referred to that as a small amount, I'm not sure we have the same definition here. Uh, You've been faithful in handling this small amount. So now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. The servant who had received the two bags of silver came forward and said, Master, you gave me two bags of silver to invest. I have invested two more. I've earned two more. The master said, Well done, my good and faithful servant. You've been faithful in handling a small amount. So now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. Then the servant with one bag of silver came and said, Master... I know that you were a harsh man, investing, harvesting crops that you didn't plant and gathering crops that you didn't cultivate. I was afraid that I would lose your money. So I hid it here in the earth. Look, here's your money back. Now, what do you notice about this third guy? Yes, he didn't double his one bag like everybody else did, but there's something else that he does that nobody else does. He projects his performance as his master's fault. Look at verse 24. The servant with one bag of silver came and said, Master, I knew you were a harsh man, harvesting crops you didn't plant and gathering crops you didn't cultivate. I was afraid I would lose your money, so I hid it in the earth. Look, here's your money back. Now, instead of saying, Master, I worked my absolute hardest, and the best I could do was give you back the entire amount that you entrusted me with. Please help me get better. What can I learn from these other two guys? Nope. He goes right to the excuses. I knew you are this way. And then he proceeds to insult his farming business model. But he does become a little bit vulnerable at the end. He says, I was afraid that I would lose your money, so I hid it. Well, that's reasonable. Now, fear of loss is greater than potential gain. This is how casinos make money. Uh, When you're down $2,000, you are more likely to double down to try and win it all back because, baby, my luck's got to be coming up. But when you're up, oh, it's house money and you're not as worried about losing it. Now, combining that fear of loss with the fear of the unknown terrified this guy. How long will the master be away? A weekend? A month? Five years? What kind of return is he expecting on his money? 2%? 10%? 100%? So frozen with fear of failure, this servant decided that not trying was better than trying and failing. Now, maybe you've been there. You're young and idealistic and you want to make a difference in your world. So you try some crazy business venture or some awesome ministry initiative. You're so passionate, you pour out your entire heart and soul into this project and it flops. You're criticized, ridiculed, and beat down by those that watched it unfold, as well as your own internal critic. Mentally, you decide, well, I'll never try that again. I'll just play it safe. 
Or maybe it wasn't even a big swing and a miss like that. Maybe you just tried to use your spiritual gift and it didn't go how you had hoped. You tried to teach a small group and nobody showed up. You tried to sing and you realized that your shower voice didn't sound as good in a microphone as you thought. You tried to build or repair something at a construction project, you got in over your head, and you had to bail. When you get embarrassed for using that spiritual gift and failing at what you thought the result would be, it is very easy for that gift to sit on a shelf, unused, and it goes dormant. Now, don't forget, spiritual gifts do not arrive fully formed. Just because God gave you a gift to host, to lead, to build, to teach, to pray, to speak, does not mean that you'll be amazing right away. You won't. You'll have a lifetime of saying yes to Jesus and developing the gift that he's given you. You don't have to be great to start, but you have to start to be great. So have you tried to use your spiritual gift and you were discouraged by the outcome? If that's you, don't give up. First of all, it's my job to help you discover and develop your gift so you aren't even sure where to start. Come talk to me. I'd love to have a conversation. And if you're looking to develop your gift, that just comes from putting in the reps. You got to use it. So talk with me or another staff member. Um, We would love to help you find a place to develop the spiritual gift that God has given you. The joy that comes with partnering with God to make a difference in your generation is so worth overcoming the dis comfort that it takes to get there. So back in our story, the master entrusted some bags of silver to three different employees of his, and he took off. What would you expect if you were him? Everyone has expectations. The master had expectations of a number that he was hoping for when he got back home. The servants had expectations of a number when they were going to work. The difference between those numbers is where things got uncomfortable. Look at verse 24. Then the servant with one bag of silver came back and said, Master, I knew you were a harsh man, harvesting crops you didn't plant and gathering crops you didn't cultivate. I was afraid I would lose your money, so I hid it here in the earth. Look, here's your money back. But the master replied, You wicked and lazy servant. If you knew I harvested crops I didn't plant and gathered crops I didn't cultivate, why didn't you deposit my money in the bank? At least you could have gotten some interest on it. Then he ordered, Take the money from this servant and give it to the one with ten bags of silver. To those who use well what they are given, even more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who do nothing, even what little they have will be taken away. Now throw this useless useless servant into outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Yikes. Just like last week's parable. These are all pretty great until that last, that last sentence where Jesus throws in the punchline. So you might see the master in this story as a wise businessman or as a villain, depending on your lens. But whatever your perception, I hope we can agree on verse 29. Here's that again. To those that use well what they are given, even more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who do nothing, even what little they have will be taken away. Now, this story is not about servants getting rich. We don't have any hints in the story that they're getting any commission on their sales, any bonuses, none of that. This is all the master's resources. And the servants have an expectation to use what was given to them and to multiply what they've been entrusted with. Now, of course, we have to ask ourselves, what have I been entrusted with? Well, there's an uncomfortable reality in the story as well. Not all the servants were given the same amount of raw materials. Um, God entrusted Moses to lead all of his people out of slavery. He entrusted Nehemiah to rebuild a destroyed city. He entrusted Simeon with sitting in the temple every day until he saw the Messiah arrive. He entrusted John Wycliffe with translating the Bible into the common language of the everyday people. He entrusted Dietrich Bonhoeffer with opposing Nazis in Germany. He may have entrusted you with running an auto parts business or serving dialysis patients. Instead of being frustrated with what we've been given or comparing our bags of silver with somebody else's, 
It's our responsibility to use what's been given to us and create kingdom value with it. A friend of mine has an incredible gift of hospitality. Absolutely beyond the shadow of a doubt, that is her spiritual gift. She lives in a Victorian 1865 home and hosts numerous events there to serve her neighborhood and her local church. For her 70th birthday, they did a major kitchen renovation. Now, many people would say, you know, at age 70, I'm done cooking. I'm ready to just eat frozen food or, you know, DoorDash or whatever people do. But she said, you know what, at 70, I've got at least 100 more dinner parties, fundraisers, house concerts, charity events, uh, and ways to love on people with food and conversation. Let's make it happen. So I've been to at least a dozen of those events in her home, and the amount of spiritual conversations, relationships built, and community change that has happened in that space is incredible. And that's just a tiny amount that I've experienced. She has lived that way for decades. Judy is someone who knows her spiritual gift of hospitality, and she uses it to make an impact in her world. Now, maybe God didn't entrust you with an 1865 Victorian home but he did entrust you with something. Do you know what it is? Step one is identifying it. What are you passionate about doing? What would you spend your time doing even if you didn't get paid? As the great poet Coolio said, if if hip-hop didn't pay, I'd rap for free. (laughs) Whatever that thing is, Uh, What what comes to your mind naturally that uh, maybe other people have said this to you. Somebody comes up to you and says, oh, you're so good at X, Y, Z, I could never. That's somebody identifying a gift in your life. Whatever that thing is, can you see how you could use it for God? That gift, that skill can be used to make disciples and establish the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. Are you willing to give that gift for God? that purpose. Well, like Mr. One Bag in in our story, you will have an obstacle. We all run into it. Fear. You will be afraid of misusing what you've been given or underperforming. But push through that and let your purpose be greater than your fear. Your gift matters to God and it matters to the local church. I invite the worship team back up. Um, Let's look at Romans 12. Paul writes this, he says, In his grace, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. So if God has given you the ability to prophesy, speak out with as much faith as God has given you. If your gift is serving others, serve them well. If you're a teacher, teach well. If your gift is to encourage others, be encouraging. If it's giving, give generously. If God has given you leadership ability, take the responsibility seriously. If you have a gift for showing kindness to others, do it gladly. Don't just pretend to love others. Really love them. Hate what is wrong. Hold tightly to what is good. Love each other with genuine affection. And take delight in honoring each other. Never be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. So this week, as I was praying and preparing this message, uh, there were three words that the Lord just kept bringing to my mind. So I had to write them down, and um, they're not an alliteration or anything creative, but these three words were important, so I'm communicating them to you. Uh, As we talk them through, identify which one the Lord is speaking to you and how you'll take action. What I don't want you to do is to agree with the concept and then not do anything about it, right? We want to more than just agree, we want to take action and move our faith forward on these ideas. So the first word was trust. What has the master entrusted you with? Whether he's entrusted you with one bag or two or five, you have been entrusted with resources, skills, gifts, talents to build the kingdom of God. What has he trusted you with? And have you trusted him enough to give it back as an offering? The second word is responsibility. 
So as we read the parable today, the master freely gave his, resp- his uh, resources to his servants, but it was their responsibility to do something useful with it. He didn't tell them how or what to do. That was up to them. But it is a weighty responsibility to be given a spiritual gift, and it's an honor to be trusted with using it for God's glory. And the final word is faithful. Now, this is about developing and using your gift consistently over a lifetime. Maybe you discovered your spiritual gift 20 years ago, but you never got around to using it and plugging it in to the local church or community. Maybe it's something that you were using during a season of your life, but your schedule got overwhelmed and your gift went dormant. We want to be faithful stewards of what God has entrusted us with. Spiritual gifts do not arrive fully formed. It's our job to discover, develop, and deploy them. God is so generous to us. Let's be faithful to give back to him what he's given. Freely we have received, freely we give. Um, As you're seated or if you want to stand, can you just open your hands as a posture of receiving? We're going to be silent before the Lord for a minute and then we'll pray. Let's take a listen uh, to which one of those three words the Lord is speaking to you. Trust, responsibility, or faithful. Father, you are so good to us. You give good gifts to your children. You've poured out your spirit to your people. You've entrusted us with everything that we need for life and godliness. You've given us the tools we need to reach our community, to make kingdom impact, to make disciples. Help us to trust you in giving back those things that you've entrusted us with as an offering. Lord, remind us of our responsibility. You don't tell us how or what, but you do expect us to build the kingdom with what we've been given. Let us take that responsibility seriously. And Lord, let us be faithful. Let us not just look to a past season. Let us not look forward to someday when we can do something. Help us to be faithful. You said to whom much is given, much is required. You've given us skills, abilities, talents, influence. We want to use those things to invite people into the kingdom of God. Lord, I think about my own life. Thank you that somebody said yes to a printing press for me to find a gospel track at a flea market. Thank you that somebody said yes to starting a local church. Thank you that somebody said yes to hiring a youth pastor. Thank you that somebody said yes to a university. Thank you that somebody said yes to taking the time to mentor. Help us be people that say yes and keep inviting people to the table. Lord, speak to your people today. We want to build your kingdom. We are honored to be part of it. In Jesus' name.